I haven't met yet. Uh, so my background, I just returned from Los Angeles about a year ago uh, after doing a doctorate at the University of Southern California. And before that, I worked at Manich University and conducted the Chamber Choir. When I got back from LA, one of the things that I wanted to do was set up a festival that focused on storytelling. So a new business, a new nonprofit organization, which I've set up is called the Irish Institute of Music and Song. And it's based in Balbriggan, North County, Dublin. Now, Balbriggan is unique in Ireland in that one third of the population of Balbriggan isn't actually from Ireland, they're international. Uh, and it kind of goes, goes inside with one quarter of children born in Ireland now are born to foreign mothers. So we wanted to set up a festival that was about storytelling. And whether that was storytelling through, you know, singing, through just pure storytelling, we didn't really mind, or even through music. So we, we set out last March, uh, or before that, to, to set this festival up. And we had 54 choirs, 2,400 singers coming to the most diverse town in Ireland, the second youngest town in Europe. We wanted to use music to help form a community in the town because the town has struggled with really integrating people into the, into the society. So uh, we did that. And then we, I would lots of help from Donald, many, many phone conversations. And the week of the festival we had, uh, the Monday was the 12th of March, which was when everything started getting bad. So first we were told no events of a thousand people. And we said, you know what, this has to happen. We have to do something. We're not going to stop. So we'll reduce the festival down to just a thousand people. We had five international choirs visiting. There was a choir staying across the road, 56 teenage girls from Canada, Canada here. There was an American choir from Florida. They were already in Balrigan, ready to go. And we were told, sorry, no more than a thousand people. So we said, fine, we'll reduce it down to a thousand people. Then the next day we were told no more than 500 people. So we said, right, we'll reduce it down to 500 people. The next day it was 200 people. So we said, right, what are we going to do? We need to do something. This is like, we, so many people are invested in this festival. You know, it was so many singers coming from all around the, Ireland and the world. So we decided, right, we can, to be safe, what we'll do is we'll hire a TV company and we'll go into one of the cathedrals and we'll live stream the entire thing. We're going to video the thing. We'll bring the choirs in all separately, uh, one by one. They're already here, just the international choirs and one local choir. And we'll get the, we'll save the festival the first year. This festival got a big impact on the community. And then we got a letter from the Taoiseach saying, you cannot go ahead. Leo Rager sent the actual festival uh, a letter saying, sorry, lads, uh, you need to stop. So we were probably the first festival hit by this. Uh, and then since then, of course, we set up the, the Irish Institute of Music and Song. And it's a, it's a new organization, facilities for choirs and orchestras. And we've been delivering music lessons. Uh, and one of the interesting things is we've been continuing with choir rehearsals during the COVID-19 pandemic, which might seem um, shocking to, to some people. We've mixed it with Zoom rehearsals. We do one-to-one -one lessons. We've got online courses in conducting folk music, et cetera. But we've, anytime it's come up, we've tried to do everything we can to do something because we've seen the positive impact it's had on, on people's mental health. And when things calmed down during the summer, we did summer camps. And um, we had bubbles before anyone else had bubbles and all within uh, government guidelines. We never, we never really stepped out of them uh, at all. So, so that's my background. Uh, and I'm excited to kind of share the stuff that we've been doing at the Irish Institute of Music and Song um, with the festival. Brilliant, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, uh, can I call upon Roisin maybe just to say a few words just about yourself, Roisin? Thanks indeed, Brian, and thanks to everybody at the festival for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel. It's a great joy to tune in from Dublin, um, though of course I would only love to be in Derry this week for what is one of my all-time favourite festival occasions. Um, so I am a choral conductor. I'm originally from County Leitrim, but I am based uh, living and working now in Dublin, where I am a lecturer at Dublin City University. Um, I conduct a mixed chamber choir called Le Tare Vocal Ensemble, which is based in Dublin city centre and indeed no strangers to the festival. We've had great times in Derry and look forward to doing so again as soon as it's possible. Um, I'm the programme director of the uh, MA in Choral Studies at Dublin City University, which I set up last year together with my great friend and colleague, uh, Sean Doherty himself, a great Derry man. And I uh, teach a, a wide range of undergrad and postgrad modules at DCU in various areas of music like music history and analysis, solfege, keyboard skills and conducting and choral leadership. 
um, I also uh, conduct uh, the undergraduate choir, one of the undergraduate choirs at DCU, the DCU Lumen Chorale, which uh, is made up of 75 singers um, who are studying music at DCU and all training to become secondary school teachers of music on the, uh, the Bachelor of Religious Education and Music programme. Uh, I am a choral singer, and that's a very important part of my life, as well as conducting as an alto in the Mornington Singers in Dublin, a wonderful choir uh, conducted by Orla Flanagan. And uh, I, I learned so much and continue to learn so much from Orla and from uh, the experience of being in the Mornington Singers, as well as it forming a huge part of my social life offline and online and even in sometimes in my dreams uh, and I was due to be a member of the international jury at the, the City of Derry International Choir Festival this week uh, and I can't wait to return to Derry as soon as it's possible. Fantastic Roisin, thanks, thank you so much for that. Um, Lucinda, can I ask you to say a few words just about your own practice? Absolutely, thank you Brian and thank you for the invitation to come and join this festival. Um, Derry's a place quite special in my heart, having worked there on so many occasions over the years. Um, so my own background is primarily in education. And when my, my main job is creative director for National Youth Choir of Scotland. And in that job, so many times, frequently people say to us, so you're the education person and your colleague, Christopher Bell's the, the choral person. Actually, no, we're both music people because we see the two go so much in, hand in hand and um, the choral work that we do and the education work we do. My background is primarily secondary music education, then primary music education. And then I thought, you know what? I quite like to do early years education. So it's kind of gone. If I say down, I don't mean down in importance. I mean down in age. Um, so I've worked with all the ages going down the way and now back doing teacher training. I work in the conservatoire doing teacher training there in the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow. And I work with the British Kodai Academy. So I'm kind of a born again Kodai person, I suppose I would call myself. Um, I'm really hugely inspired by the Kodai philosophy, largely because of its focus on singing and a progressive structured way to teach. So it's that singing thing that is really close to my heart. And as all of us here, it's that singing thing that we're now faced with that issue. Interestingly enough, when the COVID first really came to the fore, I was working in Hong Kong. I was doing a training course in Hong Kong and there were something like eight cases of COVID at that time when I was there. And oh my goodness, I was treated like royalty. You, here's a pile of masks, here's a fumigator for your room, here's a, and I thought, what is this absolute nonsense? It's a few cases of um, some flu thing. Um, much to my, um, I'm appalled to say that that was my thinking at the time. And having to teach in a mask, oh, what? I've got to sing and I've got to do training wearing this mask. Oh, for goodness sake, it was the worst thing in the world. If only I could sing still now, you, even with a mask, I'd be very happy to be singing at all. So um, National Youth Choir very much, a, a bit like yourself, Michael, when, when we were hit with this news that we can't do what we normally do. I mean, everything in our organisation is singing. What are we going to do? Um, well, let's get things out there for people to do, to sing at home. People are locked down. Let's make singing something they can do at least in the safety of their own home because people need something right now. And I think that need for me was music. And I think it wasn't just me. I think there was a worldwide need for music, that emotional release that um, music brings, that passion that's in our heart that we just want to share with other people. So we set about doing a, a pile of daily activities online a bit like but not as popular as um joe wicks you know the old joe wicks thing up there doing your daily workout well let's have your daily singing workout out there as well some singing games and things that people could do at home and that proved to be really quite popular and for me it kind of took me back to childhood you know singing around the piano singing at hogmanay in the old scottish tradition everybody had their wee turn that they had to do singing was a huge part of my life and I thought we've actually gone back to that community of singing at home right now and the most important for me is don't care where we do it we've got to keep singing so singing joyfully in whatever corner you are 
so that's a bit about me. Fantastic. Listen, thank you so much, Lucinda. Um, and Dermot, you're up next. Thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks so much for the invite uh, from the festival. Um, and lovely to be with such uh, a brilliant panel today. Uh, and congratulations to the f what, what an incredibly well reimagined uh, festival this is starting and is already ongoing. So congratulations to the festival for that. Um, I suppose uh, from the Sing Ireland perspective, we're the uh, national organisation that represents and support as well as connect and enable group uh, singing groups and choirs throughout the island of Ireland. And um, from the perspective of what's been happening over the past number of months, we've been supporting the sector in, in any way we can. We've regularly had, um, and I know many of you will have joined, uh, sessions with hundreds and hundreds of people online uh, in common cause, um, talking about what is possible, what isn't possible, yeah, but actually I, I really like today's subject matter of Sing Joyfully, which comes from a place of what is possible. Um, I was also struck by Gareth Malone Jones mentioned our introduction to the festival last evening. Um, where he said, you know, you can't stop singing groups from their need to connect. And uh, I'm paraphrasing, that's not exactly what he said, but uh, <laughs> something along those lines. And, and that's certainly true. I think um, we, we all feel that sense of loss of not being able to sing um, face to face in the way we all wish to. But um, you know, it, it's about what is possible at the moment. Singing groups are meeting, I know, on Zoom and all sorts of other digital technologies. Um, I was in a meeting earlier this week where I described it a little bit like antiviral medications or vaccines that are being developed at the moment. The, the cure is face to face singing again. And that's the, vac you know, when a vaccine comes, hopefully we can do that. But in the meantime, what are the antiviral medications for singing groups that we can apply. Do we have Zoom? There are other digital technologies, Jamulus, Digital Sage and so on. Maybe we chat about them as things go on today, but um, virtual choirs, all of those sorts of things. How do we make our singing experience online that bit better? And then how do we improve that as we go forward to face-to-face? -to -face? Um, so I suppose I've been so inspired by the resilience and the, um, real wish for people across the group singing sector to get together. And uh, as I say, just exemplified by the work of the uh, festival here. So uh, yeah, looking really forward to hearing other people's views today. Thanks. Fantastic, Derm Dermot, thank you so much. Um, uh, Louise, can I ask you to say a few words? Yes, thank you so much. I tell you, I feel absolutely humbled to, to listen to what everybody's been describing about themselves, because I think we all of us have a degree of imposter syndrome, and I'm really getting it at this moment in time. But anyway, thank you. So thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, so I, I'm a GP. I am a professor of medical education. I'm a mum. Um, and you know what? I am really new to singing. I am the <laughs> world's biggest beginner. But I'll just quickly summarize my interest and, and perhaps some of my journey. So always valued music. Um, as a medical student, I would escape on Sunday evenings from halls of residence. When my colleagues were all in the pub, I actually would go to the Royal Albert Hall because I lived really close to that. And I would go and listen to whatever was on at the Albert Hall on the Sunday evening concert um, because it mattered to me. It mattered to engage with, with, with creativity. And then um, as a doctor over a number of years, I was a GP to homeless patients. And and one of the things that was always amazing was working in the homeless day center. And, and because it was the day center, that's where people could be themselves um, and they would play music and they would sing. Uh, sometimes it was a bit of a drunken serenade that I would get from patients, but nonetheless, that opportunity to, to learn and understand more about my patients as, as individuals was really lovely, just gave insight into their lives. 
Um, as an educator, I worked first in the medical school in Southampton, where all of our first year medical students um, undertook a module where they um, did medical humanities, and that might have been drawing, painting, drama, um, but a number of them um, were engaged in musical activities and, and singing as a way of exploring um, kind of impact of, of conditions, illnesses, disease, um, events on people and their lives, because of course our patients are people. And then when I was an educator at King's College in London, um, all of our year two students who were working with GPs, um, again, participated in, in learning in, in medical humanities, again, um, in a range of modalities, but to help them gain insights into, um, for want of a better term, a, a human condition. As a mum, I watched how music has enriched my children's lives and learning and given them lifelong friends. Um, through my work um, at King's College in London, I was fortunate enough to be part of the all-party parliamentary group that looked at um, arts and health and, and the much wider benefits of, of arts um, on health and obviously singing was a really uh, important part of, of the work that and the report that came out of, of that the work of that group. I think in in medicine um, there's the it, I, I suspect Neil might talk about this as well the the the, the number of doctors um, and other health practitioners who are musical um, and and how music um, enhances their their lives um, and enables them to to treat their patients more effectively um, and to look after themselves. Um, one of the interesting things when I came to Derry was um, that I, I brought my um, some might say preoccupation with um, arts-based medical education uh, with me. And, and it's fair to say some of my colleagues perhaps didn't get it initially, but um, I took them on a journey to Galway and we went to a medical education conference there and the medical school um, sang for us, the medical school choir. And um, they sang a piece which had been composed by one of their tutors, um, which detailed her journey through an intensive care unit experience. And it was an incredibly profound um, thing to, to, to listen to. And my colleagues who didn't get it suddenly said, now we get it. Now we understand the importance of music and singing um, as a means of articulating um, health experiences and of making sense of those. And then finally, as a person, I always wanted to sing, but I never had time. And, and it took coming to Northern Ireland to allow me to, to sing. And um, and I, I am probably the worst member of Alt McGelvin's hospital choir. I, I, I joined um, and, and the music director said, so what part do you sing? And I went, I have no idea. And he said, well, what do you, do you sing the tune? And I went, uh, yeah. And he said, second soprano. I went, okay, fine. And after about a month, I, I kind of approached him. I said, look, if there's bad sounds coming from where, where I'm sitting, just tell me and I'll, I'll slink away under a stone. But, but he let me stay and, and it has just been a fantastic um, opportunity for me to make friends, to experience a, a community, um, to be joyful. Um, and I have really missed it. And I think something that I am likely to miss in the coming weeks is, is the singing on the wards at Christmas. And, and it's just, I think it, it kind of embodies the importance of a hospital choir both for the staff and the patients and and it, it that for me has been a, a remarkable experience and um, yeah it would be very sad not to have it but but how lovely to at least be able to um, be part of some conversations today and I don't think I'm going to say any more because far more people can say much better things than me. <laughs> Fantastic Louise thank you so much that's so lovely and uh, last but by no means least Neil, can you say a few words? Hi, yes, thanks very much. Um, yes, I'm an assistant director in acute services in Alma Gelsen Hospital, but I'm also a practicing physician in endocrinology and diabetes. And in the last six months, I have been a um, COVID doctor um, <laughs> in all, I think, all of our wards. Um, 
Yeah, so we've very much been at the hot end of it. I will say that Louise has been involved very uh, heavily in the, the COVID cent the GP COVID centre. Um, however, um, I'm also the chair of Alton Gelbin Hospital Choir. I'm partly responsible for press ganging Louise into the choir. Um, fortunately, um, knowing her own good better maybe than she did at the time, um, it, it's been of, of good benefit to her. I've been in that choir 10 years and it's existed for a, uh, about 25 years. Um, at times more with um, hospital members um, previously and now it still is plenty of um, healthcare professionals and, and members of the healthcare community right the way through the city across Derry and Donegal. Um, um, like Louise, uh, the, the, we greatly miss our, our weekly practices and, and rehearsals and, and there are so many modalities or, or ways that it seems to help. Um, for me, it was a break in the working week, a Thursday evening, um, always made a Friday. Uh, I felt more refreshed on a Thursday night than I did on a, you know, a, a Wednesday morning by far. Uh, so that, that choir um, has ceased its, its in-person in, in rehearsal activities, but we have been active in, in circulating around um, online opportunities for members. I think we, we stopped, we sent out guidance on, on safe management um, on the 11th of March, um, but some of our members had started to self-select. Um, quite a few members would be retired and they could feel had healthcare vulnerabilities and they started to fall away. So in the week or two before the lockdown began in Derry, we had, um, and then members had selected themselves out. We had basically stood up together and, and said, look, who is willing to continue? And, um, and we resolved to continue for as long as we could. Little did we realize, uh, um, leading up to the 11th, that, that come the, the 14th, I think it was, um, our last practice was merely days later, um, we, we would cease. Um, we have a, lots of communications. We've held a Zoom online meeting. We've held a survey, which has been very encouraging. 80% of our members want to return when it's safe. <laughs> Um, and a goodly proportion, about a third, have taken part in online rehearsals with various different um, choirs. Um, I'm a member of a second um, amateur choir, the Irish Doctors Choir, which is an all Ireland uh, body, and we would be well used to only convening in the in the week in it for a couple of workshops or weekends on the weekend of a, of the the final performance. So that choir was more adaptable, I think, to online remote um, working. So we've been engaged in with Zoom rehearsals now since since around March, and we've produced one online concert, and we're due to produce. Uh, we're in the middle of producing another one for the 29th of November. Um, for me, um, the Zoom online rehearsals, uh, although they are difficult and require considerable adaptation on on behalf of the organisation, but also on on behalf of the singer, um, have been a great relief. Um, it is not easy, anyone who has taken part, especially um, when it's the horror of hearing the recording of your own voice um, back to yourself before it was on. And there are very good reasons why, why you don't want to hear your own voice, even if you've never thought about it before. So for me, um, choral activity continues to be a relief um, from the daily grind. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be with you today. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, that's fantastic. And I think that gives us a kind of a good overview of how, <laughs> how everyone has been sitting around doing nothing. Um, you know, the sort of extent of activity that people are involved in is just so inspiring and so in incredible. And I suppose, um, I mean, it does, I suppose it does make it so clear and so evident how vital the whole notion of singing is and how it connects on so many different levels connects societies connects communities connects families connects friends and and that it's not something separate from life but is very much embedded in the sort of very fabric of all aspects of life you know and uh, you know from hospitals to 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 football stadiums to uh, community residential homes to young offenders to all this kind of sector of life that singing becomes very, very fundamentally part of and has a very fundamental role to play within all those dimensions of life. Um, so I just wanted to sort of pick up on a couple of things and maybe just interrogate them a little bit more with the panel. And it comes from the point of view of thinking that um, in art and in music, um, we look at change, the idea of change and disruption as actually a really good thing. And 
no matter what that change is, no matter what that disruption is, no matter what that restriction is, uh, it's the idea that it forces us into thinking and reimagining everything that we do in relation to music, life, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to kind of, uh, we all know, I think the, the difficulties that the current situation has brought about in terms of enabling choirs to get together. And, you know, <laughs> none of us could have predicted that, you know, our singing voices would become lethal weapons at any given point in time. Um, but, you know, we all know the difficulties and we all realize the kind of um, struggles it is, the str struggles that are presented by just not being able to get together and how that impacts people and impacts people's lives. But what I wanted to focus on was this, was, was Donald's idea essentially about what we mean by when we say sing joyfully and also what this new landscape that we're all living in and progressing through, what that really means in terms of the new opportunities, the new approaches, the new methodologies, the new thinking that might be presented because of the situation we're in. And I just maybe would like to get a few reflections from you all about, um, so putting aside all the kind of difficulties that we're not allowed in the room, we can't sing in the halls and so on, what do you see as many the, the new um, the new opportunities or the new ways of doing things that maybe have emerged from here and how that fits in with the notion of singing joyfully? Um, so, I mean, I'll maybe just open it up to the floor. I don't want to sort of single people out to say, now, what do you think about that? But <laughs> if I could just open it up to the floor of the panel and maybe just get a few of your thoughts about that. Kind of based on what Louise said there, uh, this idea of sing joyfully. Um, I find it really inspiring when people try something that maybe they never did before, particularly as, as we get older, our egos get bigger. And it gets it's, it's very hard to step into new things when all of a sudden, you know, particularly someone like Louise, who's had such an amazing career, to step into something and all of a sudden not be, you know, the best person at it. So maybe be a bit uncertain about what you're doing. And you know, we deal with choirs and of all types. We have, we, have, we have elderly choirs, we have youth choirs. And one of the things as a conductor we always want is our singers to sing as healthily as possible for as long as possible. And if they sing healthily, they'll sing joyfully because they're going to get a good kick out of their voice. When I was at USC, one of my research areas was vocology. And I was very lucky to have Lynn Helding um, as my teacher over there, who she was the editor in the Journal of Voice in America. And we had to look into various aspects of the aging voice and one of the fascinating things is people's people's well-being is directly linked to the strength of their voice as they get older so if you have someone who may be you know uh in their 80s or 90s and their voice is deteriorating sometimes they could have this kind of sound you know the voice the muscles just aren't working as well or or for various reasons and it can have a profound impact negative impact on their well-being and as a conductor, what we want to do is we want our singers to rehearse at home regularly, right? Here's your music, everyone. Learn your notes for next week. I'll see you next week. They come back, and if you've got an amazing choir, 70% of them will have learned all their notes, right? And But a lot of the reason why people don't learn the notes is maybe they don't have the facility to do it at home. Maybe they're, they're singers, but they're not piano players, or they don't play an instrument. So one of the things that this has done that I've found is it's now given people the ability at all ages to learn their music at home themselves. And why is this really, really important? Apart from the fact that they're gonna know their notes and their conductors are gonna be happy. What, it's, what it does is it allows people to practice their singing voice at home. If you, um, as an adult, do not, like any muscle, the, the voice can atrophy. And uh, the muscles around the coordination, which is the most important part, can get weaker as time goes on if you're not using it. But now people with all these various apps, with learning tracks, choir pile, different apps, people can actually go at home, listen to their track and actually practice. Mm -hmm. And if people can do that five days a week, 10 minutes practice, they can see profound impacts and actually how their voice functions for a long time. They'll sing healthier for longer. If they just do it once a week at a rehearsal, it can actually cause damage like an athlete who just goes out and runs once a week. So mm -hmm. it's actually given people, um, it's, in, it's enhanced people's, it potentially will enhance people's well-being. Yeah, no, that's a lovely thought, actually, uh, just that, uh, you know, the emphasis has kind of shifted towards people's own practice at home rather than within the, the, the sort of space of the choir or, or 
in the space that other people are. Um, uh, yes, any other thoughts on that from could that? I, could um, I come in? Of course, Louise, yes. <laughs> Please, just, thank you. <laughs> so so I, thank you, Michael, for what you just said. And actually, thank you for picking up on the whole stepping out of the comfort zone thing, because it was terrible it was terrifying and uh, but the interesting thing was being able to put myself in a position that my students are in all the time is is being asked to do something that you're really not very good at and you're right because actually I've, I've done lots of other stuff that I know how to do so so uh, that that was clearly a, a, a glaring <laughs> a glaring aspect of my learning to sing but I actually what I really wanted to pick up um, I'm actually going to be a little bit challenging um, because I, I, I hear exactly what, what you're saying about people's ability to, to access um, remote um, singing opportunities. But actually, the challenging thing is not everybody can. Um, and we've had this dialogue a lot with our um, when we've talked about our students um, at university. So one of the things that we would focus on is widening access. In other words, people who are coming from a maybe a non-traditional background. We all um, have have a, are in our own space, um, literally. But but we make so many assumptions about about where we're at, um, and we judge other people in relation to ourselves. So we all have a laptop. We all have our headphones or our speakers or whatever it is, or maybe we've got a smartphone or some sort of means of enabling us to access the internet. But I would actually be a little bit challenging here and I would say not everybody has that um, or they maybe if they have those things they don't have the protected space within which then to do whatever they need to do and and there is a risk that maybe the people who need this most who would benefit most from the joy that singing can bring just actually are somewhat excluded and maybe what we should be thinking about is well how do we enable those people given that this situation isn't going away in a hurry so i'd be interested to hear what my fellow panelists have to say about that i think it's a i think it's a great point louise and i think it's um it's uh it's a, it's actually a, a sort of thing about where we think about how is the current situation change things forever how is our thinking going to change beyond this even in terms of how we integrate uh, people but yeah i'll open it up to the panel to respond i might come in there brian if that's okay um just yeah. to make the, the the very basic point that um it's great to have zoom <laughs> um <laughs> if this was a few if this, this were a few short years ago we wouldn't have any way of continuing but um obviously zoom uh takes away the major fundamental uh, issue of singing which is or joy of singing which is singing together but at least the conductor can sing into the abyss of zoom of muted microphones and singers can sing along and another um i suppose advantage of it is that singers can join in from anywhere i mean a little mm. like what we're what we're doing today but with my own choir Leitare a vocal ensemble when we did some some zoom online singing sessions in the in the spring there in march and april um people could join in whether they were in ireland or not or elsewhere so i suppose there there are um advantages well just fundamental capacities to continue uh through in that way um and i'm just seeing wonderful things that choirs are doing i'm thinking of of say the forget me nots choir um from dublin who are conducted by nora walsh who's just a fabulously imaginative conductor in in terms of um continuing with rehearsals in spite of all sorts of, of health challenges among singers by pairing singers with carers and involving family members and doing singing activities but also wonderful uh, enriching musical activities like song sessions with great uh, singers like Charlie McGettigan and lovely Leitra Mann who's a fabulous songwriter mm -hmm. and having various guests in and I know that uh, Nora and the Forget-Me-Nots have gone from maybe having maybe one rehearsal a week I'm, I'm not sure to, to having two or three uh, sessions together uh, just to really focus on keeping the sense of community going through the hard times. Yeah. I, I might jump in just to compliment that thought from Roisin and say that um, I think, and, and to come back to what Louise is saying around exclusion and uh, how people who are the most isolated in society may become even further isolated at the moment. Uh, it's a broader societal issue on how um, how we include people and for singing groups and choirs, how, how do we represent diversity and make sure that those who might 
have been excluded um, don't don't stay that way. Um, with um, I, I suppose there's kind of two sides of the same uh, sword in a way in relation to the online activity. Uh, in some way, you would think it might give greater access and a possibility for more people, regardless of their location, to get involved. But of course, the socio-economic um, uh, reality for people, as well as their, their I think, Louise, the, the need for a, a safe space to do it in is, is, is a real challenge. And um, I think, you know, I'm thinking to uh, aging demographics or those who require care. There's been a lot of um, interventions that are different methodologies uh, are being employed, you know, online activity, but actually phone lines or even um, a trusted carer or somebody who's within the bubble can come. And I've heard stories of people being sung to in that way or sung with uh, at a distance or, or all of those kinds of things. And I think it really is incumbent upon us all to think about the ways that we can use this um, this situation we're all in as both a, a challenge to 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 what, how we would like to do things, but also an opportunity to maybe directly tackle some issues of uh, inclusion and social justice and how to ensure that we can uh, come out of this with some really good and productive ideas so that we can sing together and include as many people as possible. Yeah, and, and, and on that, the, this idea of community, I've heard the term hollow community or a hollow feeling coming with Zoom rehearsals that many people have had, um, which I'm sure people have experienced. You know, you, it's not really, some, someone came up with the term, I don't know who it was, the social distance singing, uh, that it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily choiring, it's social distance singing. So you are on your own. I think the safe space aspect, Louise, is important. And I think those people, that's, that's an issue with them through many facets of, of what they have to deal with. I think from an individual point of view, growth and, you know, I've seen conductors even 10 years ago give line tapes to people, give warm up tapes where they stick in a tape recorder to the choir. So it's up to us as a conductor to see how we can best facilitate our singers. And, and it kind of we can look at this also in a few different ways. We have the, the, the high risk community in, in society and, and what can they do? But then we, as, as it goes down and the data has shown there's different risks associated with very, where you are, um, your age, your demographic, et cetera, uh, in the community. And I'd love to know um, your thoughts, just the, the panel on, on that. So this idea of community, but then um, the various communities based on age, age demographic. And Michael, yeah. could I pick up on a point you you made, um, not in direct answer to that one, but um, related to this giving skills. And one of the things that we found very successful over Zoom is musicianship classes. And a lot of people have joined those musicianship classes, have said a number of things. One, the classes are always too far away or it's a summer school. We can't afford to come for a whole week. Um, this one really hit me. Um, I've always been too embarrassed to go to a musicianship class in case I get it wrong. But if I get things wrong behind the safety of Zoom in my own home, nobody's going to laugh at me. Nobody's going to make me feel bad. And a lot of the singers have said, we can't do choir in the normal way at the moment. So we're spending a lot of energy building our musicianship skills. And if we build our musicianship skills, we're going to enjoy choir better when we go back. Because if I feel a confident singer who can actually hold their own and read well, then I'm going to enjoy my rehearsal more. So I'm going to put my energy into um, the musicianship skills at the moment. So that for us has been a, a major um, thing. And like you said, Michael, about practicing the singing daily, that people are practicing musicianship skills daily is, is a huge benefit for me. So it's an educational thing, I know, but the knock-on effect and the positive effect, I think when they go back to choir will be huge. And that's something I see as a big silver lining of COVID. That, and I think that's here to stay. There's no reason why when we're face-to-face -face again, we can't still do some of these things online. I think that's a wonderful point there from Lucinda. And I'd be having similar experiences with uh, teaching musicianship and using musicianship as a sort of alternative 
to some choral activities because we have to focus on what is possible and not try to force what's not possible. And uh, uh, Lucinda is talking about the great advantages of um, the musicianship work for singers. And But I have to say, as a conductor, I'm working very hard on my own musicianship these days as well, because, of course, we now have to um, we have to do everything that we want to be heard in that uh, if I want my student singers, for example, at DCU to have the experience of singing in four parts, then I have to create three of those parts here at my end so that they can add the fourth one at their end. <laughs> so I'm dealing with multiple split personalities here with re a recorded version of myself on the iPad, my actual self, which is my personal favorite self, as luck would have it. And then uh, maybe the third part on the piano and then the singers um, add the fourth part. And I I'm not saying that to um, uh, trumpet my own polyphonic skills. I'd be very <laughs> sad for myself if I wasn't able to do things like that at this stage. But just to say that the, the, that that is making me do a lot of music practice that I maybe wouldn't normally have to do because my students would sing the parts and whatever at work. But uh, it's 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 a really hopeful thing, actually, listen to think about that, the benefit that that will ultimately bring when, once we're back in the rehearsal room. So thanks so much yeah. for that. Can I just ask the panel this one, one thought, essentially? Um, I think because we all are connected to singing and we're all connected to choirs and we all know how amazing it is and how brilliant it transforms our lives and all of these things. And I just wanted to ask the panel, uh, and of course, you know, we as people who are engaged with singing are always thinking, well, we can always improve our skills and we can, you know, we can focus on our own musicianship and we can develop a lot. But I just wondered, um, as you were talking there, um, I just wondered, what does the panel think about, is there an opportunity now to reach out to people who have never sung before or never been connected to singing? Is there, is there, does the situation that we're in now present the exact opposite in some ways? Is there a way that we can engage with new people and, you know, invite uh, to kind of open the door of the brilliance of singing uh, to people who have never experienced it? Does, is there something which is happening now which allows us all to engage on a wider uh, level? And, and I just, I'm just thinking of um, a conversation I've had recently um, with uh, a certain Cystic Fibrosis Society um, who, who were talking about the use of voice and how um, uh, with Cystic Fibrosis we have a certain lung restriction and people have been living with restrictions all their lives. And so, <laughs> and I started to think, um, you know, maybe there is a way of using this restriction so that people can be together where they sing instead of that big choral way, they sing in the quietest possible, possible, least you know, performative way. Uh, are there ways of reimagining those things? And are there ways of reaching out to new people? So I just wanted to open that up as a sort of a topic to discuss with the panel, see what your thoughts are on that. I might jump in briefly, if that's OK, just to say I think there are actually opportunities and oftentimes the initial fear factor for people in singing in a group or using their own voice actually uh, as a as a as a plus point in relation to the fact that we need to be muted on Zoom, they can often sing <laughs> in the privacy of their own home uh, and make whatever sound they would like. Uh, so therefore, they can build that confidence maybe before they they can come to sing in a group, and it actually might therefore be an access route uh, to getting involved in face to face singing a bit later on. Um, so yeah, I think there's there is opportunity here, and as well, actually, you talked about quiet singing, and uh, one of the most recent studies, uh, the Perform study in the UK, pointed to how the expulsion of aerosols uh, as we sing face to face is greatest the louder the um, singing or speaking is, and actually, singing quietly is contrary often to best, bo you know, yeah. it's um, something that we don't always want to, you know, it's 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 nonsense to say somebody should sing always quietly if you're trying to do something in an artistic way but actually if it's an access route or it's something that they're getting used to maybe there's an opportunity to use that experience of singing quietly um in a safe way uh, to to advantage i mean i think i guess a lovely it's a lovely lovely thought dermot you know i mean I, I started to think of all those big things that even something like ode to joy or something which we hear is huge, big thing. And I just think, well, what if you 
what if you were able to do that, but it had to be like the quietest version of anything, you know, and that you completely reimagined actually the choral repertoire in certain ways to, to re-engage in different ways. And that to me seems an extraordinarily exciting thing, but also the ability to maybe bring people into the act of singing um, and to experience that joy is something I'm fascinated with as well. Um, I just want any other thoughts on that? On the singing quietly thing, I'm so glad you brought it up because this is this is one of the ways I think that we can we can when we do get back singing together properly, uh, or maybe as we come back singing together properly, this might be something that we use. Um, definitely from a conductor's point of view, um, th there is an issue when people sing stuff very very loud for the first time because they're grooving in a motor function there. They're singing with a lot of weight on their voice, and oftentimes if you do that repeatedly, you've grooved in. The, the way of singing. So if, if you're singing it flat and you're singing it heavy, um, you're, you're gonna groove that that's flat singing in. And it also generally means if you're singing really loud, you're probably not listening as, much, as well as if you're singing quieter. But I'd love to know from our, our medical professors, our, our medical people here, has there, have there been, because I've, I've scoured the internet for this, absolutely scoured, have there been proper studies done on the rate of aerosol droplets when it comes to quiet singing. And is this something that we could do as we start bringing choirs together, say we move back down to level two um, and we can have 15 people together in a, in a group. Is this something that with masks, with social distancing, that maybe we bring our singers in and they sing mezzo piano. They never get louder than mezzo forte. Definitely, it'd be great for their listening skills. They'll probably sing more in tune. Um, so it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for the first few months. There definitely was a study in England, and I can't remember the the reference now, where they looked in in a in a theatre environment. I think and I think it was ENT it's surgeons. The, that's the performed study, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, but but Dermot, you probably better informed about it actually. No, not at all. But well, it was De Dr. Declan Costello and his team um, uh, in theatre, and and they did examine that. But I think actually the part you're mentioning, Michael, might be the next stage of that. Uh, exactly. They have a further study, and what the what the rate what they can't measure because it's not safe <laughs> is groups and how much the aerosol rate is cumulatively with a group in a room. Uh, so I think that they're they're looking at ways that they can try and develop um, testing for that and try and give some some knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, th th certainly, I mean the, the guidance from um, Sing Ireland has been superbly detailed, um, but it's been largely, of course, it's all based on the, the amount of distancing, keeping people who are at risk. Um, either away, people that are symptomatic away, um, looking at aerosolization, transfer to services, um, and trying to reduce the physical interactions between people. And, and that's dramatically reduced the potential for social interaction. Um, mm -hmm. The principles that um, the, the social distancing are the two words that have been used, but what it actually means is physical distancing. And um, when we um, opened up our sort of choral Zoom rehearsals and invite others in, there were, I mean, about about 10 people or so joined in who had never been part of the choir before. Um, and uh, each individual singer, because everyone's silenced, um, each singer is singing in isolation without any, you know, feedback or without any ability to, to tune to the, to the others at the time. And we found a couple of things that really helped us feel uh, uh, part of the experience. Um, the first one was a uh, technicality singing along to a click track wasn't helpful but as the musical uh, director after a few weeks um, was receiving some of the recordings from us no matter how horrified we were and he put them put them together um, and he uh, then um, sent them out to us as, so to sing along to and it was much much easier and you felt much much more part of the choir to sing along with the recorded voices of your your, your colleagues your choral colleagues um, whether that was in the group or or whether you as, as an individual on your own just rehearsing so the human voice aspect and your own um, group's human voice aspect was a really powerful transition for us the second thing was to uh, was um and the during choir rehearsals we need to maintain some you know in person we need to maintain we need to listen to the conductor, we need to concentrate, um, we need to um, be well behaved um, and, you know, try to keep chat to a minimum and, and, and wait till later. But actually, uh, during a Zoom rehearsal, um, a little bit of unruliness was actually quite helpful because there's <laughs> automatically discipline in the, in the silence together. Uh, 
actually really, really helpful to know that some of us were um, very unruly. And um, every now and again, someone would unmute and it would be a comment would come from absolutely nowhere, but it would cheer everyone up. And we find just who, who's going to do this next? It's not the unruly and it wasn't disruptive. But if we think about this, to protect each other, we're, we're actually engaged in physical distancing. If we only think about social distancing, then we also limit the benefit to the new members who could come in and could see that there was a relationship between the existing choral members. There was a little bit of crack. There was a little bit of um, a little bit more relaxed and comfortable with each other, even though we couldn't hear each other. It was good. So I, I would say that having a little bit of crack and being seen to have a little bit of crack is important for everyone, especially those who are a lot quieter, a lot more nervous about taking part, whether they're new members, or whether they just feel a little bit more isolated and on the edge. So concentrating on the term of physical distancing and allowing the social to take part um, is, is, is critical for us. Neil, thank you very much. So I just wanted to pick up on actually just the, the, something that you're alluding to there as well is um, how have the panel find the integration of technology and perhaps you know learning and singing through zoom um, and dealing with the sort of aspects of things like latency uh, things like not being able to hear other people sing in the choir and so on. i just wonder what your experiences was not and whether you had any kind of insight into something that had really worked for you in terms of group singing online using zoom using any of the other sort of connected uh, <clears throat> programs like team or something I might come in there briefly, Brian, just to say that a thing that I find works well online is voice training. Um, so if I uh, do a sort of an extended warm up idea with exercises for for vocal training and if I use my 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 best efforts to use excellent technique myself and then singers can sing along uh, with me, uh, I might play the chords on the piano or whatever, but um, just focusing on, on the voice training, I think, is something that, that we can make work well over Zoom and something that I felt was important in the early stages of the lockdown here in Dublin, where I felt my own voice getting rusty very quickly and just thought, right, what can I do about this? Um, and so that, that was a, a real priority for me in those early days, particularly. I've certainly found, Brian, with my um, some of my students in the conservatoire when we do online musicianship, um, that thing of just not being able to hear each other, not being able to sing each other with each other. One of the students actually said that to me. I've noticed that I'm just rubbish now because I'm not <laughs> singing with other people. So we do this mad thing. We do a lot of pentatonic work and with pentatonic anything goes, as we know, this pentatonic fluffiness, I call it. Um, we put them into little breakout groups of two or three and they unmute and they sing together together in big inverted commas because it's not really together but it kind of semi works because they can hear each other and when they're in small breakout groups then they're more um happy to unmute and help each other and do that thing together so the breakout function has been for me a, a bit of a godsend you can actually hear about two or three voices probably at any given time any more than that and you're pretty absolutely stuck. Two or three, they're and they're they're together at some points as they come back. <laughs> and say, we heard the harmony for a fleeting second, <laughs> but it's, it's the best we can do. <laughs> I think it's also important to to look at like Dairy Coral Festival happening right now. The, the, the way we're using the technology now didn't exist didn't exist when Dairy decided. You know what, lads, we're going to make this festival happen no matter what. We've got a bit of a run in. Let's make it happen. Like this Zoom that we're on didn't exist. And then after Zoom realized, oh crap, people are using this for music, they set up that new function called Turn On Original Sound, which some of you may know about, some of you might not. I just finished auditioning the Minute University Chamber Choir last night. It was posted to uh, the people who were awarded places. And during the auditions, in order to hear the sopranos, because once sopranos start going high, Zoom does things of feedback, whether they're lovely singers or not, it just detects them as feedback. So turning on original sound has allowed us to actually do those auditions mm -hmm. online. And the, the, the technology is adapting as we need it. I know I just did a little browse there for the last few months on different technologies. And there's a few ones that if people don't know about, I know Dermot covered this in a really, really, there was hundreds of people at a Sing Ireland um, online seminar, but there's two by Irish people and there's one in America that seems to be going very well. There's Stream Cycle, which is by, um, 
Mike Carney over in uh, Scotland. There's another one called uh, Choir Pal, which is brilliant for learning your tracks. If you want to, you know, stick it on. I, I've been using it with all my choirs. You record your track in and they can select the sections they want to use. The conductors can use them. But then there's also one, and I haven't seen it. Uh, I haven't used it myself, but it's called the Jack Trip. I know a choir over in San Francisco are using it. And apparently there's no latency. Now, is that going to give us a sense of community? Are we still going to feel good singing into a mic, harmonizing with people with point whatever second latency? Probably not. But it may give us an opportunity to at least work on, on, the, on our aural aspects, singing in tune, singing fifths, singing chords. Yeah. I, can I jump in on that, actually, it's just fine. to, to um, talk a little bit about um, those technologies? And I think... Uh, no more so than anything else, there's been technological invention and innovation through this period and we'll be left to that may be hopefully a good legacy of, of the COVID period that there'll be uh, digital tools to help with sound latency online and so on. So um, Jack Trip from Stanford University is looking really promising and mm -hmm. uh, not available, I think, in Ireland, but very, very soon, I think, because the server isn't in um, Ireland, but they're they're looking at it coming very, very soon. And um, there's another technology that's similar being developed by um, by German universities called Digital Stage. And again, over the next month or so, I think we'll see great advancement there. So there's there's reason to be um, hopeful that, you know, synchronous or almost synchronous singing online. Uh, that sounds like a, a, a nightmare, doesn't it? Almost synchronous. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, uh, reducing... like choirs, to be honest. <laughs> so uh, the latency will be, be, the sound latency will be reduced as much as possible. And, and it will be something, I think in the longer term that, that, uh, you know, I think this is something online working is with us to stay actually to complement face-to-face -face working. I'm sure at the, when it's possible to sing together, people will run away from online activity, yeah. but actually there will be, to my mind, a longer term view of working together online to complement the face-to-face. -face. Yeah. I think I think that's all fantastic information, actually, and quite optimistic in some ways, Dermot, and certainly the, the list of kind of programs and apps, Michael, I think is, is huge. Um, and just before we kind of open up to various questions from our uh, audience, um, uh, yes, I just wanted to, I just, as, I, as you were talking about, and we were talking about the, the sort of developments in technology and apps, et cetera, and I just thought, well, I wonder, does that mean that if you're not technologically proficient on any level that uh, and you have a passion for singing, does that mean that you're pretty well stuffed at this point in time? Or is there some other way of connecting? I just I just I'm just aware of actually what Louise mentioned earlier on in this sense of uh, reaching out to people who uh, perhaps don't fully understand what singing's about and uh, perhaps people who are not connected to technology are there any possibilities in which we can kind of enhance and connect those people to what you're doing there is something kind of quasi controversial which no one seems to have mentioned but i know people are doing all around the country uh -huh. and that is singing outside yeah. now obviously we don't live in the costa del sol uh and we're heading into the darker days <laughs> but we've had we've had Fingal Youth Choir rehearse over the past since over the past while, and they've been rehearsing in smaller groups in a car park, outdoor outdoor car park, yeah. and they rehearse for short periods of time. They rehearse for thirty minutes, masks on, very very separated, uh, and then they leave. Someone else, the room is aired for thirty minutes, even though it's not a room, it's outside, and then the next group come in and sing for thirty minutes. Now it's it's just the taste of singing. It's just yeah. a it's it's just odd. It's like a tip. It's just feeling the taste of singing. It's not going to give them as much as say they're going to get in a two-hour rehearsal. But I wonder, and I, I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I, I can't say. But are we by by I'm kind of saying you know don't we can't sing. Everyone, no one sing. You're going to die if you sing. Mm -hmm. Can we look at perhaps um, a model or something where maybe people who are at risk. Um, can sing outside, that if they're outside with masks and it's Ireland when it's usually windy in Ireland, very rarely is it not, um, are they safe? Because really everything, we're unsafe, everywhere we go we're unsafe, especially if we go to the shops there is risk, if we if anyone comes to our house there is risk. So 
depending on who we are, there's risk. So let's just establish there's always risk. No matter what, we're at risk. You step outside, we're at risk. So what is the level of risk and how much can we mitigate it to give people this opportunity? Because I know many people would much rather meet up with six people outside, just your tenor section, your bass section, and sing in the freezing cold than do online Zoom rehearsals. And it would give people that chance to, to engage. There's definitely potential in that. And uh, and if you look at the Sing Ireland guidance and making music guidance, um, yeah, they're, they're based on the principles of separation, um, uh, lack of transfer, t touching transfer services, um, but also it, it's about air circulation as well. Um, and the first uh, example is definitely to go outside. And a lot of our European partners have already recommenced choirs. I mean, our own choral director, Irish Doctors Choir, um, lives in Funchal and in Portugal and it's a lot more clement there at the moment than it is here and they can um, and of course they're, they're in a cloy out in a, basically in an outdoor cloister I mean locally um, what we looked at uh, so, so definitely we're looking at you know large either larger spaces like you know cathedral type environments with big open spaces or you're looking at outside and if we're looking at outside um, looking at multi-story car parks is the easiest model to conceive of, as, as unattractive as that is. Um, there's constant air circulation. And if we maintain distance yeah. um, and we look at um, reducing the aerosolization using masks, then we're, we are actually reducing risks as to the minimum possible. And, and the, the model you've suggested sounds brilliant. You have smaller focus groups that then leave, air exchange uh, happens, and then a new group comes in. And Michael, it sounds perfect if we as long as we can do it without getting frozen yeah and i think i think people are afraid i think there's there is this this level of you know if i suggest someone and someone catches covid i'm going to be shot and i think it's important to like let, let's not let all you know uh logic go out the window and be completely controlled yeah. by emotions and of course the emotions on the other side where it's like we want to sing we need to sing but i think you know we've been looking at this idea of healthcare, and i've heard the term being thrown around sick care that actually what we do isn't healthcare, it's sick care. We only look after people when they're sick. Well, if we actually want to look at healthcare and look after people in both physically, mentally, the whole works, why don't we look at perhaps uh, suggesting to people, actually suggesting to people, you know what, find a, find a car park, uh, find somewhere outside, maybe even with two walls so the sound will bounce off. We have a lovely amphitheater here at the Irish Institute of Music and Song. So actually there you've got three walls, so sound actually bounces off. Why don't we look at actually letting conductors notice and letting choirs and, and encouraging them to go outside? I think we'll have to have a range of solutions because choirs are so different. There are some choirs that would be absolutely willing to, to try the, uh, the solutions that we've heard today and others that would be more comfortable doing other things. There's just such variety within the choral mm -hmm. sector in all of our uh, localities. And another thing that we, we just have to keep in mind is, of course, the broader context in terms of issues like public transport, um, of restrictions in our various areas. We're at the mercy of many things that we, we can't control and not only that we can't control, but that will probably keep changing. So there's just a huge amount of contextual detail to keep in mind um, in, in terms of all the, the very, very good points made so far. And I think happiness comes from focusing on the things that we can control. And I think there's far more in our control than we think at the moment. Yes, there are people who are stranded at home. They're in rural environments. There are people who, who don't have capacity, don't have good internet. Ireland, we're still not there in terms of internet. I think we're going to have 5G floating around the air before we're going to have cables going to certain parts of Ireland. So like that's, there's just plenty of issues, but I think we getting them all down and really like, let's, let's look at what we can do. Let's genuinely put everything down and focus on what's in control. Because at the moment, every couple of weeks, something else gets taken out of our control. And if we keep letting it get to us, we're all going to be super, super depressed. So that's why, like, hearing your points, and it's, it's really, really inspiring to hear the different things that everyone's doing from an educational point of view, um, from an organizational point of view, everything Sing Ireland has been putting out. It's, it's fantastic. And I think we need to really flip the mentality to start thinking, what can we do? What's in our control? Six weeks, something else could be taken out of our control. We could literally be looking at, at something, who knows, right? But always looking at, right, well, what can we control? Obviously, online is something we can control. Um, if we have a venue ourselves, we can control it. Um, I just, I think, I think definitely, and I know most conductors have taken that attitude, but I think people need to be just reassured that uh, if you are singing outside with masks and social distancing, 
that you are mitigating your risk. Is your risk gone completely? Absolutely not. It's up to you to decide if, if that risk is uh, worth it. But I think having all the options there, I think this isn't going to be long term. It will be over and reassuring ourselves that this will be over. We'll be able to sing our harmonies again. If you're a barber shopper, you'll be able to get that sweet dominant seven chord ringing. Um, it's all it's all there for the future and being aware and being confident that it is only short term. I think there's a, if I could just come in on Michael, I think it's absolutely inspiring, you know, to think that we can work ways around that. And as you were talking there, I was thinking of uh, even just in different cultures and different societies, you know, how, say, I was in sort of Israel recently there and we have the call to prayer where we have like singing as this kind of um, kind of place within the day, which, you know, can be heard throughout the whole sort of town, city, and is a cue for people to begin singing or, or, or to begin engaging in whatever they are or wherever they are. And that whole idea of something uh, being presented like that in order to allow people to sing along with or engage with no matter where they are you know whether be it in their back garden or their yard or down at the front of the you know the town or something um you know i, I find that whole idea of or something like the happenal in poland you know which happens every hour where you hear a, a town singer singing in the middle of the town and that's a cue for people to in some cases pray but also could be a cue for other people to sing and I'm reminded of whenever the lockdown first kicked in essentially of course the first response that everyone did was get out on their balconies and sing their heads off in Italy and so on and I, and I love that whole idea that um, that there's a new opportunity for us to connect through singing in a different way than we have done um, so I just, I just wonder what your, the panel's thoughts were on that before we maybe move to a few final questions. None. That's okay. <laughs> I, sorry, I, I, I'm going to do a terrible thing, which is mention something you didn't just mention, Brian, if that's okay, just in relation to, yes, to, 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 to outdoor singing, because I see some questions and, and talk about it in the chat. And uh, um, I think the important thing with outdoor singing, you're quite right, Michael, the, the risk is much, much lower when when we're singing outdoors. I mean, you're, you're exponentially uh, reducing the risk because the aerosol accumulation isn't as high out doors i think the the greater risk outdoors is droplets and sneezing and that kind of thing so actually um masks and possibly even visors are essential outside because you know unless you can get out of the way of a changing wind and a droplet coming towards you those are the things that might might help to mitigate the risk um but i think then of course there's there's the issues that are being mentioned in the chat around how do you do it outdoors in in ireland <laughs> you know it's like um and I'd like to address in terms. I'd like to address some of them actually, because I know you mentioned droplets there. Um, like realistically, aerosols. Like if, if if someone sneezes and a droplet lands on your arm, um, are you going to get COVID nineteen? Like I, I would definitely suggest people wear masks if they're outside. But there's a comment there from Kevin Busher, one of my former students, and he's talking about well, if people are outside, singers tend to shout and strain their voice. I'd say first, as a conductor, it's your role to make sure that your singers don't shout and they only sing in a healthy way and repertoire choice will have a big, big impact on how they do that. But things you can do about singing outside, car parks are mentioned there by Neil and car parks are fantastic because you're going to get reflections from a hard concrete ground. You're going to get reflections from the side walls, et cetera. Or if you're outside choosing, singing up against a wall of a building is another brilliant way because what you're going to get is just natural sound reflections, which are going to help the singers hear each other and it's going to help them you know reduce the volume that they're singing at so i think once again let's look at what we can do and let's not try and come up with excuses to not do it every time uh, can i just come in can you hear me yes you can Louise. ah lovely hi i mean all i michael i absolutely love your enthusiasm and and i wish that we all had a, a cup full if not a bucket full of that on a daily basis because it's <laughs> contagious and it's marvelous I, I'm, I, I'm just, I, I hate to be the sort of slightly damp squib, but I, I just think we have to be really careful um, in, in terms of our 
general public health and and it's 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 the same kind of thing that we faced when 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 we were confronted with an initial lockdown locking down is easy releasing is much much harder um and i think it, it, that there are so many nuances i thought rushin made a really good point um about some of the the aspects of of kind of getting back in that that we just need to be mindful of we need to be mindful of circumstances we need to be mindful of public transport we need to be mindful that when when we make a decision about risk it's not just a decision about our personal risk it's the risk we present to others so so i i i and you know and i'm i'm so conscious of all of the benefits to our physical and mental health of resuming singing and you know i would love to be doing it i really miss everybody but but i i i just i, I i'm just giving that that kind of extra word of caution here i suppose that's my responsibility as a gp <laughs> sorry <laughs> but i think louise i mean it's absolutely absolutely important you say that you know because these are complex times and they are so uh, laden with different interpretations and different approaches to these things and different understandings you know so um i think that's a incredibly sort of valid point that you're making um but just uh, i know I'm, I'm conscious that we're sort of running slightly out of time a little bit and i i'm just conscious that we, we've touched upon so many interesting aspects of singing and how it's uh, how we can continue to sing joyfully in, in in a variety of different situations. And I do want to kind of open it up a little bit to those who have kind of tuned in. And uh, perhaps if anyone has, I, I think, um, let me just see, was it Bernadette actually just wanted to say a few words about hospital staff choir? Um, Bernadette, are you there? There you are. I see you there, Bernadette. I think... Hello, everybody. Yes. Hi, Bernadette. Hi. I'm Bernadette Kiley, living in Cork. I just want to talk. One of my choirs is a staff choir in St. Finbar's Hospital. And uh, about a month ago, I sent out word that we would try an outdoor rehearsal. Now, we're in the position that we our rehearsal takes place between one and two every, every Wednesday. Anyway, it's lunchtime. Now, unfortunately, with uh, the hospital choir, uh, Quite a few of them were spread into other hospitals for the COVID. Another batch were working from home. So I only had a group of six people. We rehearsed outside. They all came wearing masks and I had a mask and one of the nurses came with a visor for me as well. She's in charge of PPE for all the hospitals around the country. So she said, this is for me. So I wore a mask and a visor, which was tough, I can tell you. But we did it outside, the weather was beautiful. And I had uh, four quiet pieces. And afterwards they said they were just so excited getting the music together the night before. One of them had actually come off night shift, decided rather than going to bed, she was going to come to a rehearsal between one and two in the outdoors. And she said it was better than three hours sleep. She absolutely loved it. Man was passing and he sat on a wall about 20 feet away and just sat through the whole rehearsal and was delighted with that. So we were hoping to do the following week, but as nature would, it lashed rain, so we had to cancel it. So all along the last few weeks, it hasn't worked. I have sent out word that sometime in December, we were going to watch the weather forecast. And we're going to sing a few Christmas carols out of doors on the grounds of the hospital. Uh, whatever day weather will allow us. Another little anecdote to that is from that choir, we have a lovely little group in the hospital, which has come from the stroke clinic. They have a, day, they have a weekly day and they have formed a choir. So we do a concert with them at Christmas and Easter. Now these are very vulnerable people. So unfortunately their clinic isn't happening, but they're missing out hugely. They definitely wouldn't be in a position be working on zoom or to be even tuning in for chats on computer it just you know it just wouldn't work for them so they're at a big loss uh, that group but hopefully in december we will have an outdoor group singing a few carols on the grounds of the hospital so that's, Fantastic. Bernadette, that's so 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 great to hear actually uh, can i just open up to anyone else um if you want to say something you can put your hand up or you can just put on your can they can you switch on your own microphone and just say hello 
Ryan, we had a question there from Matthew Greenall. Oh, yes. Matthew, if you'd like to ask your question. Oh, hi. Sorry, I've, I've woken up now, Fiona. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading your uh, WhatsApp. Uh, now, uh, Brian, I just you you very modestly not very talk, talk talk very much about your own practice during lockdown as you've been chairing. Yes, I wonder if you could share with us something something of your experience of being a composer during lockdown, about writing for singers, rehearsing with singers. Whether there are any international comparisons that you could provide for us on how this is being done. Uh, yeah, yes, thanks, Matthew. Uh, I mean, I guess that um, I mean, in many ways, I I do come from the sort of the angle that all restrictions, all disruption is actually a good thing and and the way to kind of reimagine things. So um, yes, I mean, in terms of actually putting music together and how that sort of falls out, to be totally honest, I'm still uh, wrestling with different ways of doing that and different um, uh, sort of processes that, you know, you're kind of connecting with. I think the thing about, I suppose, as I was talking to Donald earlier on the week, actually about this, is the thing about choral music. I suppose that the essential ingredients are that you're usually in a space and that you're creating this sound which comes at you from all angles, you know, bounces off walls and so on. And you simply can't do that on an online platform. Um, and also, when you're in a space listening to singers and choral singers and um, you, there's a bandwidth of audio that you're experiencing, which again you just cannot do online, you know? Um, so it makes me think about trying to do things that feed into that narrative. Um, but it's, I mean, to be, if I'm totally honest about it, it's, um, it's a process for me and, and I, I haven't got any clear uh, kind of approach to it, but I feel in my gut that there's, there's, there's something fantastic to be done there, you know, and it, maybe it involves outside, maybe it involves inside, maybe it involves rethinking how we use the technology. Like, I, you know, latency is a big problem, you know, but then I started to think, you know, well, what if actually all those pieces that choral singers are singing, you know, were presented in a very different way? Like, what if, what if latency was part of the piece, you know, part of the reimagining of the choral piece, mm. all of this stuff. So, so I still think of all these kind of different angles that can be adopted and approached, uh, which make us rethink how we do things. Um, but I, I am, I'm on a process and I, I, it's still an ongoing and evolving thing. And everything that you think might work sometimes when you do it just doesn't. Uh, for all sorts of reasons and actually uh, when you do that uh, you have to kind of do it uh, like some of the stuff about sort of people recording things and putting recordings together and um, you know recording things at home sending them in compiling this sort of large piece they kind of work but then they don't work and and even things like which are about we have to, like Donald and myself and so many the orchestras and so on we've done so many pieces with involve hundreds of singers who are not singers singing and they're able to do that because of the sort of comfort zone of people around you singing and how you engage those people in this environment is really tricky because uh, you know there's 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 a lot of forgiveness when it comes to singing when lots of people are in the room <laughs> you know both in terms of <laughs> what you can get away with what you can kind of you know you're not the center of attention so all of those are you know i think just things that we're all wrestling with and certainly i'm wrestling and i you know we for this little piece that we started that will be com was commissioned by the festival that we're doing tomorrow evening it's basically the start of something it's like the first movement in the process in the process of things which i think will evolve over the next year as we just embrace the current situation so um so that doesn't answer your question at all matthew but <laughs> i don't know i thought that was a very interesting answer thank you <laughs> but so i think we'll just sort of we're, we're sort of at the point of kind of trying having to wrap things up i'm just struck by the amount of chat that has been coming in on the side which in many ways reflects the whole social nature of a choir it's just a lot of people saying hello to each other and you know hanging out and it's nice to feel that you know although we may not be able to sing there is still that sense of community and connection happening um, even when we're not singing and um, 
So I just want to kind of really wrap things up. I want to say a huge thanks to our panel, Michael Roisin, Lucinda Dermot, Louise, Neil. Um, I think the discussion has been incredibly informative and illuminating and, and so many different levels. And I just would like to give you a actual round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and just say it's been a total delight. Uh, Donald, you might want to say something just before we finish off, perhaps in total. If he's there, he's gone to sleep. No, no, I'm trying. To... <laughs> I certainly haven't. Can you hear this? Yes. Yeah. That come through. No, I most definitely have not gone to sleep. Uh... <laughs> That was just such a fascinating discussion. I feel that uh, we could have a wee break for a cup of tea and come back and continue. <laughs> I, would, I would genuinely love that. But I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious of the very precious time um, that people have given up to be part of this discussion, panel members especially, uh, and all participants in, as you say, the very lively discussion that's going on at the side as well. Brian, you've referred to that. Um, I'll just say that there were so many pearls of wisdom, and I mean that uh, from so many different perspectives, which I had hoped would be uh, the case, of course, with passionate uh, contributors and members of the panel, and that's what has proven to be the case. Um, it, 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 it's worth considering. Uh, the title, by the way, Sing Joyfully for the Symposium, was deliberately chosen as a throwback to our very first panel discussion. And I remember, Dermot, you were a member of that original panel in 2013. And I'm very struck, can I say this maybe, by how much more real the conversation is today than it was in 2013. In 2013, we, were, we thought we were doing the right thing by talking about Sing Joyfully, but we were talking about structures, we were talking about organizations, we were talking about how long do you rehearse, we were talking about, you know, things that really are not the same level of pertinence or meaning as we've just been discussing for the past hour or so. So I genuinely thank everyone for such um, thought-provoking insights, thought-provoking suggestions. It certainly left me with a lot to think about. Um, I still hold on steadfastly to the notion of sing joyfully. Um, we said in one of our you know, many publicity blurbs and so on about uh, join in, sing along. We look forward to singing with you. We absolutely hold to that over the next five days. But I'm going to leave with my comments with just, a, again, a massive thank you to everyone. Um, but with Neil's words, in fact, I'm changing Sing Joyfully to just have the crack. Uh, <laughs> thank you again, everyone. Uh, there's lots to enjoy. I hope to see you over the next five days, virtually, if not an actual pr a physical presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Bye. Bye.